From White Collar Criminal to one of the leaders in White Collar Criminal Reentry into Society, the turnaround story continues with a big announcement from a man on a mission. This is Business Talk with Jim Campbell. Jeff Grant is the co-founder of Progressive Prison Ministries, the first ministry in the country created to provide confidential support, counseling to individuals, families, organizations with white collar and other nonviolent incarceration issues. And his white collar support group recently held its 250th online meeting. Groups had over 300 participants, averaging about 25 attendees at each meeting. A little backstory, after an addiction to prescription opioids and serving almost 14 months in federal prison for a white collar crime committed in 2001, Jeff started his re-entry earning a Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary. And after graduating from Divinity School, he first served at an inner city church in Bridgeport, Connecticut as Associate Minister and Director of prison ministries. Welcome back, Jeff. Hi, Jim. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, again, I love your back, uh, your office there. It looks great. By the way, not only is this a great comeback, but I owe you a big thanks. You have really, really helped support the launch of my book, Madoff Talks, and that looks like a promo, but it has meant a lot to me. And um, let's start off again. Give people a background first of what it was like to lose everything, your law license, your business, your career, your home, your marriage, and I assume some friends. Probably all my friends, Jim. Um, wow. I, was a, I was a big fish in a small pond up in, in Westchester. My office was in Mamaroneck. We lived in Rye. And I had a, a successful law practice by probably anybody's um, view. Uh, 20 employees working for me. And I was also general counsel to uh, some major real estate companies, uh, management, equities, and brokerage, and um, living the good life, way too good as it turns out, because I became addicted to prescription opioids after a sports injury. And um, over the course of about 10 years, uh, as I was getting, as I was continuing to get these prescriptions, uh, my life kind of just decayed to the point where uh, I couldn't show up at work. I was, I ballooned up to 285 pounds. I was vomiting up blood and um, I was just uh, insane. Um, the day came when we couldn't make payroll and instead of uh, doing anything reasonable or rational, I uh, borrowed money from the uh, attorney escrow fund, which means I took my client's money uh, repaid it, but did it several times again. Um, always easier to do the second time than you do the, than the first time. Um, knew that it was just a countdown to my losing my license. Um, a, attorney grievance uh, procedure happened soon thereafter about something unrelated, but then they asked for records. And once I had to deliver my records to the grievance committee, um, they started an inquiry and I uh, hired ethics counsel. That inquiry took a little over two years, as I recall. During that time period, 9-11 happened, um, which shook me hard. Um, I was already hemorrhaging business, um, mostly because of the drug use and my not showing up. But um, post 9-11, there were uh, SBA loan um, um, options being given out. At that point, it was uh, EIDL loans, you know, economic injury loans. And I called them up and I said, and I asked them, I said, um, would I qualify? And they said, because I was in one of the counties directly uh, um, juxtaposed to New York City that I would qualify. But nonetheless, what I did was I, um, I lied on the, on the loan application and said I had a uh, office near Ground Zero. Um, I got the money, $247,000. It did nothing to help my law firm because I, as I was going to lose my law license anyway. And then on June 28th, 2002, um, it became clear that there was no way for me to save my license. I resigned it. I went home that night with a bottle of uh, Demerol, 40 tablets of Demerol, and uh -huh. tried, to, tried to kill myself. Hey, Jeff, that, that, you know, I, I had that in my notes before, but it didn't even make sense to me. Why, if your firm was qualified being in Westchester, did you apply it in, through New York City? Was it faster or something? Was, did you want to get caught? 
Um, what a great couple of questions. I mean, the first is, is that all the SBA loans were being handled out of New York City. So, and there was no rational reason why I, I said I had an office in New York City other than I was desperate and I was crazy. And I was handling sophisticated law at the time. Um, I knew better. Um, there's no way I, I did things that there was no way I would have let clients do because I, I wound up misusing the funds as well. So yes. it wasn't, so it wasn't like I was, um, it wasn't like that. This is a mistake. Um, the, um, uh, what was the second part of the question? Uh, I think, I, I think you answered in the sense mm -hmm. of why you did it. The question now I have is I didn't realize this, 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 uh, addiction went on for two, 10 years, which is amazing. Were you in denial or what was dri what, what was driving that? Or how did you go so, so long before everything collapsed? Well, it wasn't like that was my first, my only experience uh, using drugs. I mean, I was a I was a kid growing up on Long Island in in mm -hmm. the sixties, seventies, and in the eighties. So I I, I I definitely was not a saint, mm -hmm. but um, never uh, kind of a daily in um, had to use it every day. And it wasn't just that it was denial because um, yes, it was denial, but like every mm -hmm. addict, every addict, um, um, as, um, as I would come down or as I would go to, to withdrawal, I would say, uh, you know, this is the last time I'm ever going to do it. And then two hours later I was, yeah, I know you look, you know, I was looking, you look so great right now. You showed me pictures at 280 and man, you did not, you didn't look well. Now, what was it like? On the family side, now your marriage collapsed too, right? And, yeah. And I, were you alienated from your kids as well? How did that side go? Um, everything went well. I mean, my family was certainly rocked hard when my mm -hmm. business went down and uh, when it became public. And we had to leave uh, our house because we were going to lose the house. So um, we moved to Greenwich. That's when we moved to Greenwich. I actually moved to Greenwich, which wow. is one of the wealthiest towns in the, in the yeah <laughs> right so I, I we moved to greenwich when i lost my money and i lost my career <laughs> but we moved into an apartment and um mostly i moved to greenwich for two reasons um, um i thought that it would be a good community because i i still had a uh a, a child who was in high school at that point and i thought it would be a good community for her and also um that's where i was going to recovery meetings so I was going to three meetings a day at that point. And so I was connected to that group and I wanted to, um, you know, I wanted to be healthy and, and Greenwich has a very robust recovery community and probably has, I don't know, 50 meetings a week. That's and a good point. Yeah. So did, um, did you, did this also surprise me a bit? You didn't have friends that stuck with you at all. Did they think, was it just a social thing? You know, we well, it, it, it wasn't that I had no friends that, stuck with me i had a few but but mostly i was i was one of those kind of big shot grandiose lawyers and i owned a <laughs> restaurant in mamaroneck yeah. and i was on the school board in Rhineck, and so i was just this kind of larger than life character and people must have been saying to themselves you know this guy's out of his mind you know, I, I spent too much. I spent too much. I, I was overly gregarious. I was, I was wacky. And even at the school board meetings, uh, which were at night and they were televised on local cable access, I, I would wear sunglasses at night at school board meetings <laughs> because I was in no shape to be out in public. And so I was just a character and, uh, <laughs> It didn't really stop me from being, for, uh, up until the le in the end, it didn't stop me from being a uh, incisive, uh, um, good lawyer, you know, someone who was really helpful to my clients. But I would say in the last two years, everything disintegrated and I wasn't able to be there for anybody. As we get to the, the last minute in this segment, do mm -hmm. you have to hit rock bottom in these kinds of a things? I did. I believe that many people do. Um, I'd love to, uh, I would love to think that for anybody, you don't have to take the escalator all the way down to the bottom floor in order to reach out for help. But um, certainly the people who I met in, uh, in Greenwich recovery, um, 
if they were heading to prison or they were, had a criminal justice problem, almost everyone said, like, go, go, go talk to prison Jeff. He'll, uh, he'll, help, he'll help you through this. And uh, I did uh, with a lot of them. All right, we're talking with Jeff Grant, quite a story here and, and totally honestly uh, conveyed as you just heard. And uh, again, my book, Madoff Talks, Uncovering the Untold Story Behind the Most Notorious Ponzi Scheme in History is now out. You can go to madofftalksbook.com to the website and, of course, go to Amazon and other places uh, to buy it. We're going to get into Jeff's big announcement as uh, the comeback is basically a full uh, 360 degrees. I'm Jim Campbell, host of Business Talk with Jim Campbell, and now author of the definitive in-depth account of the spectacular rise and fall of Bernie Madoff. Madoff Talks, uncovering the untold story behind the most notorious Ponzi scheme in history, including exclusive access to Bernie, Ruth, and Andrew Madoff. What motivated Madoff to commit such a massive fraud? How Madoff managed to keep the scheme hidden in plain sight despite numerous SEC investigations? The true scale of the investment losses and the victim's ongoing fight for justice. The book, Madoff Talks, is generating outstanding praise. Leading Wall Street investigative reporter William D. Cohen, the New York Times bestselling author of House of Cards, said that Jim Campbell's book is riveting, insightful, but ultimately poignant and sad. How Campbell got the Madoffs and so many others to talk I'll never know. He's done a great service with this fabulous book. Madoff Talks, uncovering the untold story, available now from McGraw-Hill. We're back to founder of Progressive Prison Ministries, Reverend Jeff Grant. And you heard earlier that he resigned his law license. And he recently told me uh, the big news, which I'll let him do now. And again, uh, is this incredibly rare? Go ahead, Jeff. Well, you don't have to call me just Reverend Jeff Grant anymore. Now you can call me Jeff Grant Esquire again. (laughs) Or, you're, or, no, you're no longer grandiose or anything either. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> look, I'm still in shock, Jim. Let's face it. It's On May 5th, I found out that my law license was reinstated by the uh, Supreme Court of the state of New York, and I'm practicing law again. And I couldn't be more grateful and more humble for the opportunity to have a second chance and to do it right this time. You know, um, it wasn't because it wasn't just the... The, the opioids. It was also um, the focus. My focus was on materiality. You know, I it was more, more, more. And now I'm um, dedicated to being right sized and living within my means, and and to delivering service to mostly the white collar justice community. That's who I suspect will will seek me out. Um, uh, at least at first, because uh, of all the work we've done with uh, white collar folks over the last 10 years in our ministry. Um, and that's already happened. People are already seeking me out, which I'm, I'm very, very grateful for. But um, it's, this, it's such a difference having a, a, a spiritual component and actually caring about uh, the outcome, caring about what happens. So um, if, if you want, I'll give you a little bit of uh, of uh, structural, um, why I decided to do this, um, and, uh, what, I'm what I'm thinking about in terms of a practice. Great. Tell us how long this process took too. Well, it took three years oh. and, um, I, I literally hired an ethics attorney in, um, June or July of 2018. And I knew it was going to be a, a long, arduous process. And certainly I had to submit I don't know, a stack of documents, maybe 12 inches thick. It, it's, wow. it's, it's, it's on the floor here next to me still. I haven't put it away yet. And including, I had to write my narrative. So I wrote 14,000 words. Wow. And because I, I took the position that I was going to tell the truth, the whole truth, no matter how ugly, no matter how many warts it had on it. And all the good stuff, too, because I really have spent uh, a lot of years trying to rehabilitate myself. And yep. certainly that was in nonprofit work and uh, advocacy and programs and in, uh, and in the ministry. 
and as an ordained reverend. So there were a lot of good things, but there was a lot of difficult things that I had to explain. Um, and certainly, um, uh, I didn't know how the, what the outcome was going to be. So I decided to tell, really tell the truth and tell them absolutely everything. And um, it took, and it wound up being 14,000 words. And to do that, Jim, I, I had to let go of the outcome. Like, yeah. just tell the truth, go through the steps, and whatever they decided had to be okay. Um, and it was a shock that in last October, um, we got a copy of the report from the uh, character committee that they had recommended my reinstatement. Wow. And so literally every single day at four o'clock, he went to the mailbox, went to the website. No, I went to the website, website the, okay. the pellet division website, and it was on my phone. So it's like really little, you know, it's in tiny little print. And I looked for my name and every single day I said to Lynn, my wife, I said, I would tell her I'm not on the list. And then um, it was uh, May 5th and she just happened to be, FaceTiming with my stepdaughter, Skylar, who uh, goes to school out in California. And I saw my name and I, and I clicked it and I read it on my phone. And it was the only, op the operative part was just one sentence. Basically. And so they don't, they don't give you any advance notice, right? Eh? No, no advance notice. So I, in fact, I, I told my lawyer, I knew before my lawyer did because I had been checking it every day. Although they, they had emailed him. And uh, I went upstairs and printed it out in my office. And as I walked into the kitchen, I had it in my hand and my stepdaughter just kind of knew. And she pushed record on the FaceTime. Oh. And so I slipped it in front of my wife and my wife saw it and she starts scream and yell and dance and it's all caught on video. Oh, and so it gives you chills. Oh yeah. my God, it was unbelievable. So then when we sent it to our friends, we sent, I think I sent it to you this way. I sent it with, um, by text with 30 second clip of Lynn dancing and freaking out. And so what a gift. And um, so life has changed radically already in, in the two or two and a half weeks it's been since we found out. Yeah. Does this, uh, it, was this, was this a very low odds deal? Um, it's a good time in the world generally for felons to put in applications to get admitted to the bar, not in every state, but in a lot of states. It, 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 there's certainly a, a new level of uh, understanding and tolerance, and um, but not so much for reinstated lawyers. There's a difference between someone who is a, say a felon who applies to the bar or someone who was disbarred who applies for reinstatement. And so the chances were uh, smaller, and especially since um, it was a financial crime. So it's a, it was a crime of trust. So right. I really had to prove my trustworthiness and my uh, competency. And I guess they saw it that way. And, so. and the fact that you were actually in prison um, narrowed the odds further? or um, I, I, you know, I don't really know the answer to that. I think okay. that... I think that because I viewed prison as part of my recovery and I went to prison almost four years sober. So there's no doubt that my story is really um, two, the hallmark of my story is really two things. The first is that it's a sobriety story. So I will be sober 19 years this, um, this summer and there's no way that I could have accomplished any of this without being sober. And the second is, is that it's a love story because um, to have met Lynn after um, um, my marriage um, disintegrated and to have the, the support and, and love of a, of a woman like Lynn, because I was a very bad bet, Jim, let's face it. I mean, who, yeah. would, who would be with a guy who was about to go to yeah. prison? But she must have seen something. And I certainly saw something in her because she's an amazing woman. And... We've been together now for uh, 16 years, married 12, so 16, 17 years we're together. And um, she started the ministry with me and, um, and uh, now we're looking to the new parts of this where we can 
be of higher, better service, best, highest, best use of, of um, to be um, to the white collar community and to people who are in crisis. All right, we're talking with Jeff Grant. It's really a, a, a great story, and uh, there are a few people that do the, the um, full amount of good works that this guy has done throughout this whole period. We'll be right back. Would you like to host your own radio program or podcast? Park City Productions 06604 is a Bridgeport, Connecticut-based radio broadcast solutions company. Follow us on Instagram, like us on Facebook, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's Park City Productions 06604. Call us at 203-522-8801. We're back with the Reverend Jeff Grant, now Esquire officially as of May 5th. You resigned your law license in what year? 2002. Wow. Now, you mentioned love affair with Lynn. Listen to your passion. Do you, you have a love affair with the law, being a lawyer, too? Is... Uh, absolutely. Um, I hope what happened here is that I've, I, I've gotten back to the core reasons that I wanted to be a lawyer and reasons I wanted to be a, a minister because I was always the problem solver, go-to guy when I was a kid and the kids I hung mm-hmm. out with in high school and all. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I always wanted to be that person who could really help people, but help them holistically. And that's part of the driver of why um, I wanted to get my law license back because what I saw was um, that there was a, a limit to the representation that people were getting when they uh, were arrested for white collar crimes or when they were in crisis in general. So let's just take the example of someone who's arrested for white collar crime. Um, most or all of their resources go into hiring a criminal defense lawyer. And then that lawyer will do the best he can. Um, I'm not going to be critical of criminal defense lawyers. They're, they're there for a job. And some of them do it very well. And some of them, like anyone else in the world, some of them not so well. Mm-hmm. But then they, um, they, uh, they get the defendant to sentencing. And then you never see the lawyer again. And n- nor should you. The job is over. But then this person has the rest of their life. Maybe they're going to prison. Maybe they're not. And there's been no one heretofore who has specialized in private general counsel work for the criminal justice community and specifically the white collar community. And I was a general counsel. I represented closely held and family owned businesses and their owners. So not only was I driving the company, for example, doing mergers and acquisitions, uh, real estate, uh, complicated transactions, but because it was family owned, there were succession plans, there was estate planning, there were all kinds of interactions um, with other lawyers. I would hire uh, specialty lawyers, whether it be real estate or, um, or tax or, um, or, or trust in estates, but also I hired white collar lawyers and a lot of them because some of the people I represented were getting into trouble. So I became very well versed in, in uh, white collar def- criminal defense and in what it was to quarterback and be the paymaster for teams of lawyers. And so now you can understand why when people, someone gets arrested or they become a target of a white collar crime, they don't know where to go. What, what do you do? You've just been arrested. And who do you ask? Uh, you, ask you, you call your buddy, you call your, your uncle, you call your dentist. Who do you call? And you say, listen, I just got arrested and I need a white collar lawyer. And everyone says the same thing. Oh, you got to call so-and-so. He's the best white collar lawyer. And they run there and they're in trauma, but they don't know it. 
the yeah. person who's just been arrested doesn't know that they're not making good decisions or not capable of making good decisions while they're in trauma. And they pour out their heart to the first guy who they've met because so one of their friends has recommended them. And then they have no idea if he's the right lawyer for them or not. They have no idea if he, what his qualifications are. They have no idea if they're going to get along with him. All they know is that they've probably written a big check. And then three months later, maybe they recoil a little bit or they, or they gather themselves and they go, wait a second, did I hire the right guy? And um, usually um, there's some kind of remorse. You know, there's some kind of uh, buyer's remorse. It's like, uh, like, what did I get myself into? And so the first thing I want to say to your listeners is you don't have to rush to do anything. You know, you don't have to, it's like, you're not going to marry the first woman you date. You don't have to make a, a, a decision that's going to be a life altering, a, um, an, a, uh, irrevocable, uh, decision because you've used up all your resources right yeah. away. Um, so that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to have people subscribe to the long-term plan. What is it? Any businessman, and it's mostly business people who get arrested for white collar crimes. They understand. They understand what the com complexities of business is. They understand the complexities of having a long-term plan, but they can't apply it in this particular case because they're in trauma. So they're, they're worrying about the wrong things, but they don't know it. So Literally, what I'm trying to do is to prevent people from waking up 10 years later and saying, you know, if I knew then what I know now, I would have made my decisions completely different. So since I've been through it myself and I've worked with over 500 guys in the ministry with their spiritual issues and their emotional issues and also just generally being someone who understands all these things, mm -hmm. I can tell you that there's an entirely different way to make decisions that's going to help them out in the longer term have much better results and at a less expensive price, better outcomes, less expensive price. And that's why I'm making the case for general counsel in, in general, but certainly for anyone who has these issues. So it sounds like uh, rather than viewing it as transactional, you're going to be around almost to counsel them through the whole process? A lawyer who cares. How about that? Okay. Right? Um, but I love that you said the word transaction because the key really is to stop looking at it transactionally and right. really look at transformatively. Because most people who have these issues can't go back to their old way of life. Maybe they're not going to get their licenses back. Maybe their families are going to decay. They can't go back. So what you really need is the skills to go forward. And that's into an abyss. That's into things that people just don't know about. Because when you're tapped on the shoulder by the FBI or IRS CID, or you're tapped on the shoulder, you've entered a new world. You've entered a new community. And it's just a question of time before you get into acceptance about what your situation is. Did you, or, or do you help people or intend to on what prison is like or the adjustment? I mean, did you have that help? I didn't at the time. And part of that was because it was early internet. Now there's a lot of information out there. Do I think that there are some valuable resources out there? Yes. Do I think that lawyers should be able to prepare their clients to, for what's ahead of them, yes. I think that most of them are, are woefully, most of the lawyers are woefully ill-prepared yeah. to give counsel or information to their clients about what's ahead of them. Um, I would be the first one to get on the bandwagon to change that because I don't think there's any reason why people who are being um, prosecuted have to be spending money all over the place and, and rounding up their own uh, resources and bits and pieces all over, all over the internet, especially when they don't know how to trust. And that's why we started the white collar support group that meets on Monday nights. So um, that's been going on for over five years. Actually, this coming Monday night is our 259th online meeting on Zoom. And technology has allowed us to have a support group 
that brings people out of isolation and into community all over the country and frankly now from all over the world. Are you going to be able to, I mean, you've seemed like to me, you've sacrificed so much doing all these good works. Are you, are you going to be able to, and maybe you, it's not an issue, rebuild your finances as well as, a, as an um, you know, offshoot of all this? You know, rebuilding my finances is, 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 is really way down there in my consideration because the kind of finances that I was building at the time was I was trying to build an empire. Yeah. Like, like, like every young buck, right? Like I was a young guy and I thought I was going to have private planes and I thought yeah. I was going to be, you know, I, you know, I, it was completely irrational, but I didn't know it at the time. And now what's the most, the most important thing to me is to uh, have the duality of, of trusting and being trustworthy of, of, of having rich, intimate relationships. And frankly, I have that in the ministry with a lot of guys, a lot of white collar guys. So there's no reason why we can't um, just transfer that to a law firm where we're actually having rich, deep relationships and we count on one another. For an, an example is, and I already have, I already have some clients and what they're shocked is, is that I give them my personal cell phone number. So we text back and forth when you're going through the most difficult days of your life, yeah. if you're not be able to reach the person who you've charged with the literally your life and death. And I say, I'm available 24 hours a day. That doesn't mean I can get back to you 24 hours a day, but you just text me. And the minute I'm free, I'm going to text you back. And what a gift this is to be able to be in relationship and in community with people who are really right on the edge and really need someone to talk to in a moment's notice. It's a great story. All right, we've got our final segment with Chef Grant coming right up next. Chef Grant survived prison and just got his law license back. Was there an impact on getting it on your self-esteem or you view this as a day-to-day thing and in that sense? I, I didn't even know how things were coming out sideways for me. The, first of all, being a lawyer is in my bones. And so I couldn't really use, do my highest best use to the world and to the people who I was helping because I was um, not able to really give them the, the advice that they needed. And also in terms of my own personal self-esteem, I knew that something was missing. And I really wanted my kids to be able to look at dad and be able to say, well, you know, dad's back, you know, that, that yeah. and it's a hard thing because I, I, I have um, two daughters who I love and a stepdaughter who I love and, I'm sure they were proud of what I was doing, but in their mind, you know, still, you know, dad used to be a guy who walked around in, in a suit and walked around and, 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 and he held his head high. And for many of these years, I, I couldn't hold my head high. You know, I, I, eventually I did as a, as a reverend, but, um, you know, I was shamed and embarrassed yeah. and, um, and less so now. Now coming full circle, really, obviously you got in trouble by fraud on a loan application. Um, and when we talked about this before, the PPP loans were coming out, we said, boy, this looks right for fraud. Tell us where we're at. Well, here's the crazy thing, because I've been telling my story for almost 20 years now in different contexts, and certainly on the speaking circuit and at conferences and guest preaching and, and on radio shows like yours a few times now. I said I had a white collar crime. I was I, I committed a white collar crime, but the context of it being an SBA loan, nobody yeah. cared about. You know how unsexy a, a topic is 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 disaster loan fraud or SBA loan fraud, but of course it's now one of the biggest topics in yeah. in the world, and not just in this country but all over the world. So dawned on me last year that we are heading for this perfect storm, like, like post 9-11, what I got caught up in, 
where there was going to be a lot of money uh, out there that was going to be have limited underwriting. And in this case, the uh, the government released a trillion dollars of uh, disaster loan money um, and over 10 million loans. And they were um, anticipating that there would be a certain amount of fraud, what they considered to be an acceptable level of fraud, because they had to push the money out quickly. So acceptable level of fraud, if it's 10%, that's a hundred billion dollars and a million loans. So right now, law firms and accounting firms are all gearing up and they know there's going to be a lot of prosecutions. I'm the only person I know in the country, now I might be wrong, but who's actually out there talking about the fact that I went to prison for SBA loan fraud and I'm a lawyer and I have all these resources. I have not just other lawyers that are all over the country, but I have uh, forensicists and mitigation experts and uh, forensic accountants and all of, I've been working with for all these years. And now the focus is on how to get people successfully through what will be audits and prosecutions for SBA loan frauds, which means PPP, PPP2, EIDL. And then not just that, the uh, the issue is is that one of the one of the reasons that we have problems is that m- many many people in a in the boom economy we had over the last ten years they were pushing off payments of their taxes and pushing off their their nine forty ones and pushing off their uh, their quarterlies to the next year because after all every year is going to be better than the year before so there's a lot of people who didn't pay their taxes or their employees taxes. Um, in 2019, thinking they would catch up in March and April of 2020. Well, March and April came in 2020. And as it turns out, there was nothing to catch up with. Not only did yeah. they fall into this desperation of having to quickly put together information to be able to apply for these PPP loans, but they're already behind the eight ball for the things that they didn't do right in 2019. Yeah. So, so people are freaking out because this cascading effect, because if they get audited for a PPP loan or an EIDL loan, inevitably their tax returns from the year before are going to come into play and what they did or didn't do right. It's going to be a big mess, gratified that I'm someone on the front lines who knows all about it and uh, both personally and professionally. And I want to help people through so that they get as little damage as possible, because this is really crisis management right at the right at the at the front line of crisis management, and then help lead them hopefully to happy, prosperous lives on the other side of the problems. Boy, it's a, it's really an amazing how the timing has worked out just a year after the PP loans, when all this stuff is going to be investigated and everything, and. I couldn't think of anybody with better experience. How can people reach you at your law firm? Well, it is grantlaw.com. So if you ask me how I got the name Grant Law in in 2020, and the answer is I've been paying to maintain that domain name for 20 years, for 20 years in case I would ever need it again. That and is believe- optimism. That's optimism. That's you, right? That's entrepreneurial, um, you know, optimism. I've gotten big offers for that domain name too, Jim. So it's grantlaw.com and uh, I've opened offices on, uh, in the city, in New York City at West 43rd Street. And uh, it's jgrant at grantlaw.com is my, uh, is my email address. And um, there's also tons of resources at prisonist.org, which is still going, which is the ministry. That's prisonist like feminist. And between those two websites, there should be tons of, uh, um, of resources available. But uh, I'm available right now 24 7 because we're just launching the law firm. And when I tell you that, I'm getting five or six inquiries a day and from people who are suffering. I want to help. You know, this is, this is a very personal mission for me. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a, and I can vouch, by the way, that Jeff is available 24 7. It's a, uh, we often text it. Uh, we any we, weekends or whatever. Are you going to still do White Collar Week and Criminal Justice Insider? We're reanalyzing how that's all going to work. Some of the um, some of the people in the ministry are stepping up because, frankly, it, it's probably time for a changing of the guard of the day to day in the ministry. Although I'll still run the White Collar Support Groups and uh, group, 
And, um, but we'll see about all of that because we want to make sure that we're delivering product and we're delivering resources that are thoughtful and, and carefully considered and are going to be of best use to people. Congratulations to Jeff again. This is great news and um, the world's going to be better off with him uh, back doing his passion and bringing to bear all of the uh, experience he's put in. You can listen to our, our YouTube uh, channel, Jim Campbell Radio. And again, the Madoff book is available at all your bookstores from McGraw Hill. Thanks to Jeff. Thanks to our national audience. See everybody on the next edition of Business Talk with Jim Campbell.